Hi, this is just a short presentation to help you solve adoption mysteries in your family tree. And we're going to cover a couple of things you should do before you begin, uh, which DNA tests you should use and why. Uh, then we look specifically at how to help a mother find her adopted child and how to help an adoptee find his or her biological parents or family. Now, there are three important questions that face adoptees before they embark on this type of search. And they are, how do I identify my birth parents or my adopted child? How do I approach contacting them or their families? And how do I protect people from getting hurt, including me? So these are questions that you should really think about before you begin this type of uh, activity. Often people will pursue the identification stage anonymously and privately using traditional genealogical methods and then only after that will they decide whether they want to go any further. They will gather the information first, identify their birth parents or alternatively their adopted child and then decide what to do with that information at a later stage. But with DNA, uh, anonymity is more of a problem. If you match someone, they will see that you match them and they will see the likely relationship that you have to them. So uh, you should consider using maybe a disguised name or a disguised email address in order to preserve your anonymity. Also, it pays to be prepared, and that means having your letters written. So if you're an adoptee, uh, maybe you want to write a letter to your birth mother or to your birth father in advance of doing this uh, research uh, so that you know what you're going to say to them well before you find them and also to their subsequent children and even their grandchildren. Uh, you may, if you're a birth mother, uh, want to write a letter to your adopted child uh, and maybe his or her children and his or her adoptive parents or siblings. These are all things that you should consider doing. And it means doing all of this within the context of an adequate support network. So before doing anything like this, I would certainly recommend engaging the support of your family, the support of your friends. There are a variety of different support groups and Facebook groups out there. And you should also think about getting specialist help, such as that available from Search Angels. Um, this is a much more proactive approach than you might have anticipated, but it's something you would have had to do anyway if you wanted to have contact with your birth family. So which DNA tests uh, do we use to do this type of research and why? Well, I'm going to look primarily at two different types of DNA tests. The first is autosomal DNA and the second is Y DNA. Now, doing a DNA test is actually very simple. You either swab the inside of your cheek or give a sample of saliva into a tiny little test tube uh, which then gets posted in the post to the lab. And in the laboratory, they look at your sample, they extract the DNA from the test tube, they run it through their analyzers, they post your results on your own individual web page, protected by your username and password. And not only that, but they compare your de details with everybody else's in the database and they see if your DNA matches anybody else in the database, and then they give you a list of those matches and post that list on your personal web page. The other great thing that you can do is you can get involved in a variety of different projects, and there are some projects available that are specially set up for adoptees and those who have been touched by adoption. Now, let's take a look uh, a little bit closer at that DNA in the test tube. What you have done when you scrape your cheek or give a saliva sample is you've given some of your cells into the test tube and your cell consists of uh, this big round blob here with the green blob in the middle and below that are uh, these blue uh, structures, which, structures which are called mitochondria. They contain mitochondrial DNA and within the green blob, which is the nucleus, is the nuclear DNA and that consists of 23 pairs of 46 chromosomes. So you've got two copies of chromosome 1, two copies of chromosome 2, two copies of chromosome 3, and so on and so on. And you get one copy of each pair from your father and the other copy in each pair from your mother. And that adds up to 46 chromosomes altogether.
Now, the last pair of chromosomes, pair number 23, are known as the sex chromosomes, and these determine whether you're a man or a woman. And a woman will get two X chromosomes, a man will get an X and a Y chromosome. So, chromosome pair number 23 is either two X chromosomes or an XY chromosome. And that will be important for when we're looking at trying to determine the surname of your biological father. Now, the three main types of DNA test are the Y DNA test, and Y DNA is passed on from father to son, to son, to son, to son. So by looking at Y DNA, you can actually go back along your father's 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 line. Now, it does not get passed on to women, so this test can only be done by men. Um, so if you are a female adoptee, you might have to test your adopt your uh, full brother. Uh, that would be if if you if two of you were adopted and you know that you are biologically related to each other, then you'd have to get your brother to do the test. If you don't have a brother that you know of, then um, this is not something that can be done by women. Um, the second type of DNA is mitochondrial DNA, and this is passed on from uh, mothers to all of their children, both boys and girls, but only the girls can pass it on to their children. So um, when it gets passed on to men uh, and to boys, it stops at that point in time and doesn't get passed down on any further, but it will be passed on by the daughters to their children. So testing your mitochondrial DNA will take you back along your mother's 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 line, and both the Y-DNA and the mitochondrial DNA can go back thousands of years. In contrast, the autosomal DNA, which is really the DNA from all the other chromosomes in your cell, uh, that um, goes back along all of the ancestral lines, but it only goes back about five or seven generations. That's about 200 to 250 years from your date of birth. So that's uh, the autosomal DNA. Now, the Y DNA and the mitochondrial DNA are useful for both deep and recent ancestry. The autosomal DNA is useful for only recent ancestry within the last 200 to 250 years. The Y DNA is useful for identifying the surname of your birth father. Um, the autosomal DNA can identify your parent, your child, and other uh, relatives going back to about fifth cousins or so. And the mitochondrial DNA is not much use for adoption cases and is only uh, used in very specialised circumstances. So the main types of tests that we'll be talking about today are the autosomal DNA test and the Y DNA test. Um, we'll also be talking about three different companies. And the reason why we recommend testing with three different companies is because each of them have their own database. And in order to swim in three different pools, we should test with three different companies. And those three companies are Ancestry DNA, which has a database size of about 400,000, most of it being autosomal DNA. And 99% of the people in the DNA database are, in fact, American. Um, 23andMe, in contrast, contains about 600,000 uh, people in its database. All of them have been autosomal DNA tested, and about 90% of these people are based in the US. Family Tree DNA is the third company, and that also has a database size of about 600,000 people, but most of them have done Y DNA testing, and only about 85,000 of them have done autosomal DNA testing. But 70% of the population of this database is US based, and 30% is non-US, including many people from Ireland. So all three databases have their pros and cons, and it is useful to test with all three companies in order to swim in all three data pools. Now, the cost of doing the test is $99 with each of the companies, but uh, with 23andMe, you will have to pay an extra $80 to have it delivered by DHL. And with Ancestry DNA, it is not currently available outside of the US, so you will have to get a US friend of yours to buy the test, have it sent to their address in the US, and then they will have to send it on to you uh, by a subsequent post. So that is a little bit more involved, but is still uh, feasible. Um, 
the other thing that one should consider is when you get your results, uh, you should upload your results to GetMatch, which is a free utility, and it allows you to compare your results with people who have uploaded their results to GetMatch, and that is another way of comparing your results with people in other databases, in other data pools. So that is something that is free, and it's something that everybody should do. So how do we help a mother find her adopted child? And you'll all probably be quite familiar with the story of Philomena, um, which was made into a movie recently. And Philomena uh, gave her child up for adoption back in the 1950s. He came looking for her, she was looking for him, but the two of them never met. And unfortunately, he passed away before she found him. But if she, for example, had taken a DNA test and given a DNA sample to these three testing companies and ordered an autosomal DNA test, um, her results would have appeared four to ten weeks later. And if her child was in the database, it would come up as an immediate 50% match. If he had a child himself, then that would come up as a 25% match. And if there were other of her relatives in the database, like a first cousin, a second cousin, and so on, then these would come up with varying percentage uh, DNA shared between, between them. So um, this can be a way of instantly finding a relative. Um, if the child is in the database and has been sitting there waiting for the mother to come along and test, it may be that you actually cut through all the red tape, all the bureaucracy, all the documentary research, and you could find your child in the space of the four to ten weeks that it takes to process that DNA sample. So because of that, it is important to have your letters ready and to have your support network alerted because you are going to experience strong emotions and they need to be processed. Be prepared. Have your letters written. What do you want to say to your child? What do you want to say to your grandchild? What do you want to say to the adoptive parents of your child and any of their natural children? And how do you best go about doing it? These are questions that you need to ask yourself in order to be best prepared for a positive outcome for the whole exercise. Also have your support network alerted because there will be many emotions. They will be strong, they will be mixed, and everyone will need time to process them. Uh, resist the urge to be impulsive. Sleep on it. Let it uh, mull over, let everybody mull over it for a few uh, days before taking any action. But what if your child is not there? Well, in that situation, your DNA can remain on the database if you want it to. And that way, if your child or any of his or her children ever do a DNA test, you will come up as one of their close matches. And this might be in five years' time or it might be in 50 years' time. So you could leave your DNA as a legacy to future generations. So that if any, uh, at any time in the future, if your child or uh, his or her children uh, go searching for you, uh, your DNA will give a very clear message that you tried to search for them and you've left this clue, if you like, to your discovery on the database. Um, in order to do this, you would better uh, have your beneficiary information entered into your profile and um, you may even want to have a link in your profile to a blog or a website that tells your story. Um, or it links the child to a further source of information. So that's the first part of the presentation, how to help a birth mother or find uh, her biological child. But how do we help an adoptee find his or her biological parents? Um, there's two parts to this. To this. Uh, the first part is to identify and trace your birth mother. The second to identify and trace your birth father. Um, and before you uh, turn to DNA, you should really have exhausted all of the other documentary means of searching for your um, uh, birth uh, family, uh, your biological parents. 
and you can download tracing guides uh, from the Adoption Rights Alliance website and you see some of the uh, hyperlinks there at the bottom of the screen. You can also get information in relation to tracing uh, from the Council of Irish Adoption Agencies website and they have separate booklets for adopted people, for birth parents and for adoptive parents. And you should also consider registering with the National Adoption Contact Preference Register. So let's look first of all at identifying and tracing your birth mother. The first step is to get your non-identifying information and that means contacting the adoption agency for non-identifying information um, and if you don't know the name of the adoption agency then contact the adoption authority for the name and they should be able to give that to you. And the non-identifying information will contain information such as perhaps the age of your parents, uh, maybe perhaps a description of your parents, uh, perhaps some health information. It really varies a lot from case to case. The second step then is to get your adoption certificate and uh, you get this by um, th this one contains your original date of birth although this is sometimes falsified by up to uh, six weeks um, and they're available from 1954 for adoptions that took place in Ireland only. If you require a foreign adoption certificate then you have to contact this number here. Um, this is what an adoption certificate looks like. It has the day, month and year and the country of your birth, your adopted name, your gender, the name and address of your adopter or adopters, uh, the occupation of them, uh, the date of the adoption order and the date of entry and signature by the registrar. So not a huge amount of identifying information on your adoption certificate. But you can use your date of birth to find probable illegitimacies that year. Um, and that means searching the births register. And you can either do this online at the new uh, free Irish Government Genealogy website or at the General Registry Office. Now, the new Irish Government Genealogy website is irishgenealogy.ie and this has births, marriages and deaths up to 2013. And this only came online in June 2014, so at the time that I'm recording this presentation it is very new indeed. And you can read more about it at this blog post on Irish Genealogy News by Claire Sentry. The alternative is to actually go to the General Registry Office in Dublin, which is at Warburg Street, and they will charge you two euro uh, for, for every five year period you want to search or 20 euro for all periods for that particular day. So the, the new website actually makes it a lot easier and you could combine both methods if you wanted to. The search strategy is to look for probable illegitimacies in your birth year, um, identify all births where baby's surnames matches the mother's maiden name and that is indicative of probable illegitimacies. Um, you should search six months either side of your date of birth um, all four quarters for the year plus the first quarter of the following year. Uh, the quarters are January to March, April to June, July to September, October to December. And maiden names first appear in the register in 1900, rather inconsistently until about 1928, and thereafter they're much more regular. And you can get the actual date of birth from the register as well. Uh, this occurred during 1900 to 1928, and also from 1966 up to the present day. Um, also, if you're going into the uh, GRO in person, do check the back of the book for the handwritten late registration entries, just so that you don't miss anything. Step four is to check each birth certificate against your non-identifying information. So you'll come out with a list of possible illegitimate births for that particular year of your uh, year of birth and you need to check each of these against the non-identifying information that you have received from the adoption agency and by doing that you should be able to eliminate some of these uh, birth certificates as not being you. Um, you need to order each birth cert from the GRO. In person in Dublin you can only take five certificates per person per day so it's rather limiting I prefer to write to the General Registry Office in Roscommon and there's no limit on the number that you can actually get by that means. It will be four euros for each uh, photocopy of the entry or eight euros for a full certificate. 
Um, I think the four euro option is absolutely fine to start off with. Um, you can compare the information on each cert with that in your non-identifying information and narrow down the list of possible contenders uh, for your birth certificate that way. Um, if you're lucky, you will be able to identify your birth mother um, using this method. And then the question is, do you try to trace her? Um, if you can't identify your birth mother using the methods so far, then you need to try other search strategies. And you may even need to reconstruct the family trees of all of the contenders in the hope of eliminating them as possibilities. Um, that means possibly searching for birth certificates for all the potential mothers, uh, because this will give their fathers details, searching for their marriage and death certificates, uh, searching electoral rolls of available, and the 1939 electoral roll is available for free on that link you see at the bottom of the screen. You may need to search old telephone books. You may need to build her family tree and put it online um, uh, with the hope that you might find a cousin. And there's various websites where you can upload these type of trees, such as Genes Reunited, Ancestry, My Heritage, Roots Web, and it's important to privatize living individuals because you want to avoid causing um, upset. Uh, you can also use Google or Facebook, LinkedIn or Twitter, all the social media sites. And there are also a variety of other genealogical resources available. You see a list of them here that will help you trace living uh, relatives. So these are all very useful uh, sources that you could explore. Uh, using these search strategies, you may be able to identify and you may even be able to trace your birth mother that way. If all else fails, though, you should consider a DNA test to identify and trace your birth mother. So let's look at this DNA test. Um, if the adoptee, again, provides a DNA sample and tests with all of the three major companies, Family Tree DNA, 23andMe, Ancestry DNA, and orders an autosomal DNA test with these companies, the results will come through in about four to ten weeks. And if the adoptee's parent is in the database, that will come back as an immediate 50% match. If the adoptee has a half-sibling in the database, that will come back as a 25% match. And if there's an other relative in the database, such as a half-nephew, a half-first cousin, a half-second cousin, and so on, there will these will match with the adoptee and uh, at varying degrees of uh, strength. Uh, so the results will tell you how much DNA you share with these genetic relatives. And um, the closer these genetic relatives are to you, the more likely it is that you will be able to identify who your birth parents, both father and mother, actually were. So it is important, as before, to have your letters ready and to have your support network alerted, because you will need that support. Now, a quick win is possible. You might find a, a, a parent, a half-sibling, a, a half-cousin, a half-nephew, a half-niece. Um, it's possible, but it's highly unlikely, because most of the matches that you're going to get are uh, rarely closer than second cousin. Um, but if you do get a close match, then it is important to have your communication strategy planned in advance. Uh, be warm and enthusiastic. People respond to this. Um, tell them something along the lines of, I see that we are genetic matches. Would you like to explore our connection and see if we can find our common ancestor? A general kind of approach like that is non-threatening, and warm and enthusiastic and friendly and it doesn't start any alarm bells ringing and this is uh, the the initial email that you send to these people should be relatively brief and straightforward don't tell your story all at once give them time to digest your information offer to share your family tree it's your adoptive family tree but you don't have to tell them that initially uh, they are genealogists and this is what they will expect Build a friendly relationship with, with, with them. Uh, many people will be eager to help when they hear your story. 
and don't get disheartened if you get no response from some of your matches. Some people simply don't respond and it's for no particular reason. They may have lost interest, they may not check their mail uh, that frequently, or they may have just done the DNA and decided it's too technical for me, I don't want anything further to do with it. Whatever happens, it may be necessary for you to do further targeted DNA testing of your match's family members, and you may have to offer to pay for it yourself. So just be prepared that you will need to spend a little bit of money on further DNA testing. Now that's close matches. With distant matches, well, it's a little bit more difficult, and most matches will be more distant relatives. Uh, for example, um, I have 360 matches on my family tree DNA test, and none of them are close relatives, other than those that I've tested myself. I have five second to fourth cousins, 28 third to fifth cousins, 53 fourth cousins are greater, and 274 fifth cousins are greater. Uh, and many of them are likely to be false positives uh, and, and not actual true relatives of mine. But the only ones that really we're interested in looking at are the closer ones. So anything up to maybe um, third cousin would be preferable. And that accounts for maybe about 10% of my 360 matches. It gives me, or brings it down to, about 36 matches in all. Um, it is hugely important to collaborate with these matches, and you may have to reconstruct family trees if necessary. So a little bit of genealogical knowledge and how to use uh, genealogical resources uh, will be necessary and that's why it's a good idea to build your adoptive family family's tree because it gives you a little bit of know-how about how to develop family trees reconstruct them and collaborate with genealogists who are the main type of person doing this DNA testing in the first place. Um, most Irish family trees can only go back to about 1800 so it can be difficult to get beyond that brick wall and that has the effect of limiting the possibility of connecting with people who are more distantly related than third cousins to you. Now, um, there is a group in the US called DNA Adoption, and they have um, a DNA project specifically set up for adoptees on that particular uh, web link that you see there. They have 2,400 members, they have developed tools for using distant cousin relationships to pinpoint likely biological family, but these require matching with people with extensive pedigrees, usually beyond the 1800 brick wall that we have in Ireland. And if you are interested in exploring this, then they have a website called DNA GEDCOM, um, in addition to their website dnaadoption.com, where there are a variety of different tools that you can use. Uh, they also have a Facebook group and they also run courses and um, this type of work takes months and can take years but more and more I am seeing and they are seeing people writing in saying that the methodology has worked for them and um, every week there's at least one message now where somebody announces I have found my birth family. So the methodology works, but it does require an intensive amount of work, and it helps if you have genealogical experience before going into this type of activity. So that's uh, about working with close matches and identifying and tracing your birth mother. Identifying and tracing your birth father takes uh, the same type of process, but we're going to throw the Y DNA into the mix as well, and the first step is to take a Y-DNA 37 test. And like I said, this only works in males because only males have the Y chromosome. Um, if you, uh, you either do it yourself if you're a male or if you have a biologically related brother whom you know has the same father as yourself, then you get them to take the test. Um, and if necessary, you could upgrade from 37 markers to 67 markers and even up to 111 markers, depending on the results. So we'll look at that now in a second. The second step is uh, 
you identify several likely surnames from the list of matches that you have. And then you search for these surnames among your autosomal DNA matches. And using the same methodology as we've seen previously, you collaborate with your matches, you reconstruct family trees. This time you're looking for your biological father. Um, and again, further targeted DNA testing of presumed close family members may be necessary. Now, let's just refresh ourselves about why DNA. It goes back along your father's 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 line, and um, it can help identify the surname of your birth father. So, for example, if I look at my Y DNA results, and here they are on Family Tree DNA, um, and I've, I've uh, anonymized and pr or rather privatized some of these matches, but you'll see that at 37 markers, I have a variety of matches here uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people. Um, uh, one of them is called McLaughlin, the next one is called McMahon. There's a Gleason, a Neville, a Sykes, a Hart, and a Markham. So from this list of people, uh, nothing really stands out as a possible... Uh, all of them could be the surname of my biological father. But at 37 markers, there isn't enough resolution to give uh, more information. However, if I change the marker resolution from 37 to 67, then what I'll get is three matches at 67 markers, Gleason, Gleason, and McLaughlin. So on the basis of these three matches at 67 markers, it would appear that the most likely candidate for my birth father would be a man named Gleason. And uh, that is exactly the situation, because that is my dad and his name is Gleason too. So that is how doing Y-DNA testing can actually help narrow down the candidates for uh, the surname of your birth father. In this case, it was Gleason. I've seen other cases where it's not quite as exact and not quite as definitive, and other cases where it is much more definitive. And even at 37 markers, there's no doubt what the surname of the birth father is. So it will vary from individual to individual, and that's why you may need to upgrade from the standard 37 marker test to a 67 marker test and a 111 marker test. So, to summarize then, DNA may be a useful additional tool in the search to solve adoption mysteries in your family tree. It may cut through all of the red tape in a matter of weeks, but probably not. It may be a quick win, but probably not. It may compromise your anonymity, uh, your anonymity, and you, and you need to take that into account. Um, before doing the DNA test, it is important to write your letters, plan your communication strategy, mobilize your support network because you will need them and you will need to prepare yourself. You'll need to prepare yourself for uh, breakthroughs and for breakdowns, for excitement and for disappointment. And you will also need to collaborate effectively with your genetic matches, uh, because that really is the key to success. So it certainly can be a useful tool if you have exhausted everything else, um, and it's not something that you should do unless you've gone down the documentary route, first of all, and uh, have exhausted the usual non-DNA means of trying to find your biological family. There are a couple of success stories available on the internet, on YouTube, which tell uh, how DNA has proved to be successful. They're worth checking out, and they are uh, certainly some of these stories are very, very moving indeed. And in terms of resources and links, there are a variety of different uh, resources available online. Do check them out, and best of luck with your search for your biological family. Thank you.